Guys, my name is Anthony Fontana. I'm an IRS enrolled agent with EA Tax. And today I'm going to be going through this IRS form 433A OIC for the offer and compromise. This is a collection information statement for either wage earners and or self-employed individuals. If you're going to be filing an offer, you will need to start with this form here. And this is kind of the meat and potatoes to the offer and compromise. And it's going to determine if you qualify for this offer and what your offer is going to be. So I'm going to be going through one that I filed for a client of mine that actually did get accepted and the exact numbers that I used on his return. Um, we're going to be obviously making up some names here, uh, but nonetheless going through kind of everything with his situation and some of the, I guess, rules behind some of the numbers that we used. and. Uh, the information that we use to determine those numbers. Okay, uh, so the first section here is pretty straightforward. I think anyone should be able to fill this out. But it's just you know name, date of birth, social, his marital status. He's not married. His address. He did rent his house. Um, he lives in Orange County in uh, California here. Phone number. Right, we didn't put mailing because it's the same. Does not have a spouse. He claims his two daughters and his mother. Okay, and those are both on the 1040, which is the tax return, and they do not earn income. So we put no there. He is not a wage earner, so we do not fill out this section uh, for him. Now, as far as personal assets goes, he had two bank accounts. One was a checking, the other was a savings. And these, these are the numbers that he had on the bank statements. Uh, the last statement that I had before we filed the offer, this is what was in there. OK, um, so we have a 300 in the checking and a thousand bucks in the savings. He didn't have any other bank accounts, so we don't uh, put anything there. But if you do, you know, you'd add an attachment and list those out just like this. Um, so you're going to add everything together. Right. One B, one A, B, C, and then minus a thousand bucks. So that's what we get here. The, the bottom line is the 441. OK, um, then we go down the list here. He didn't have any investment accounts, stocks, bonds, nothing like that. So we skip the sections. We put zeros when we don't have that. You don't want to leave anything blank here and kind of leave it up to the IRS to to guess here. OK, we just we tell them, hey, we don't have anything. So we put zeros in there. Didn't have any virtual currency, none of that. So everything's a zero in uh, in the second part here. In retirement accounts, again, didn't have any retirement accounts, so I'm putting zeros in there for him. No cash value life insurance policies, nothing here, zeros, so zero on that out. Uh, in the personal assets continued, real property, he did not own a home, again, he did rent, so we put zeros there. Vehicles, he did have a car, okay, uh, so I did fill this out. He owned this car, so we didn't have a payment on the car, but... I did have to get the fair market value of the car here, the current market value. And the way I did this is I go on to Kelly Blue Book and I look up his car and I get um, a fair conditioned price uh, for that car and his mileage. So I did that and that's what that 5,000. Iris gets, gives us the 80% allowance here. So that's what the 4,000 comes to. That comes straight across and then we get the minus. They give us another allowance, 3450. So I did the 4,000 minus the 3,450, the balance is the 550, okay? He doesn't have any other cars, so that 550 drops straight down, okay? That's the total for his cars. Um, other valuable items, he didn't have any of these. Artwork, collections, jewelry, safe deposit box, nothing like this. I did not fill that out. So then we had to add, uh, we had to total up the available individual equity and assets. So we're looking lines one through seven. So really all we have is the car, the 550, and the banks, 441. So again, one through seven. So one, two, three, four, five, there's that six, and seven. So that's the 991 is total available uh, equity in the assets for this offer. OK, he is self-employed. So this is where I had to start filling things out. OK, uh, I just put, you know, he, he doesn't actually have an, a, a registered business. He just files a Schedule C sole proprietorship on his tax return. The name of his business is his name. He doesn't have a tax ID or EIN, so I don't fill that out. He just uses his social. So 
pretty straightforward. He is a mechanic, doesn't have any employees, kind of just works for himself. Uh, business name, same here. But nonetheless, okay, just this uh, sole proprietorship is all I'm filling out here. The business assets, okay, he doesn't even have business bank accounts. He uses his personal account as like his business bank account too, uh, which is probably not the right thing to do. But nonetheless, I mean, that's in reality. So we didn't actually have any business uh, bank accounts. So I just put zeros in there. Now, he did have assets, business assets, uh, as far as what he uses in his business, right? He's a mechanic and he uses tools. So he's got all the different types of tools that he uses to, you know, to do his business. And those actually totaled up $5,000. Okay. Uh, I ended up creating a statement of all the various tools that he had. I had him kind of fill that out. Um, whatever power tools he had, uh, wrenches, toolbox, um, lights, all that type of stuff. And we valued it at about a $5,000. Now, you'll see here, Iris allowed deduction for professional books and tools of trade, right? Line 10. Um, this sample here online does not let me fill this out. But nonetheless, I put in there $5,000. And the reason I did this, and you'll see this, this comes from the, sorry, wrong one. Yes, the, what they call the internal revenue manual for the offer and compromise. And I will include links to these uh, sections here uh, from the IRS's website, but you'll see, right, IRS website, here it is, um, for income producing assets. This is for the business, okay? And this is, uh, has to do with the offer and compromise. Uh, but when you'll see here, this is his situation. There are both equity in the assets, right? The $5,000 that are determined to be necessary for the production of income and available for income stream produced by those assets. Then compare the value of the income stream produced by the income producing assets to the equity that is available and determine if there's an adjustment to income or expenses is appropriate. There's a lot of jargon here, okay? But what I am essentially arguing to the IRS is that that 5,000 in assets that he has that potentially he could sell and you know give that 5,000 to the IRS. But I said, you know, if he sells that, then he's no longer able to produce income moving forward. So that's what this is saying is that, is that it is necessary for the production of income to move forward by these assets. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm arguing. These are what they call income producing assets. Nonetheless, I'm not hiding anything. I'm telling the IRS, hey, here's all the assets. He's got $5,000 worth. These are all the different types of assets. These are all what they individually are worth if he were to sell them. But he can't sell them because then he's no longer able to produce income moving forward. So what I do there is I put IRS allowed deduction for the professional books and tools of trade. I put that 5,000 into the values of Line nine minus line 10, zero, right? 5,000 minus five is zero. So that's what I did for him. Long-winded here. Uh, let's see, moving along. Notes receivable, he's on a cash basis. Doesn't have notes receivable, accounts receivable, nothing like that. Um, so we're just adding line eight and 11 and enter that here. So we're looking at line eight up here, line 11 right there, zero. Business income and expenses for self-employed. So if you provide a current P&L statement for the information below, enter the total gross monthly income on 17 and monthly monthly expenses on line 19 below. Do not complete all the other lines is what that's saying. So that's what I did. I created a P&L for my client um, and I just did that for him. Made it look nice for the IRS when they got, kind of go through. It's kind of limited with all these categories. So for him, you know, I made it uh, real specific to his business. But nonetheless, he's got some income and some expenses. Bottom line, he's got some income. Okay, that was his monthly income. Monthly household income and expense information. So he, so here's all other types of income. Uh, if he were to have wages, uh, any other type of income here, interest distributions from businesses. He didn't have anything here. So which I should do on this example here. We're marking fat zeros on all these lines. Anything you don't have, you mark a zero on, okay? So that's what we're doing. Um, so he had zero there. Total household income. Add lines 30 through 38. He's got nothing there, okay? So now what we're doing here, 
monthly household expenses. This is very crucial here, so got to pay attention, okay? These are a lot of these are what the IRS kind of gives, some of them they don't. There's a lot of rules involved on what we can use as expenses. Okay, so we know what the income is for my taxpayer, $8,000 a month, right? But what does he get to exclude from this offer cuz he's got to live. So they're going to give him an allowance for food, clothing, miscellaneous. And what we do is we go to the IRS's website, Collection Financial Standards, okay? And they give us the standard for the food, clothing, and other items. So we look at the national standard, and we know in his case, there's him, his two daughters, plus his mother. So there's four people on this, okay? So we got a total of 1740 is what we get to use in that column, 1740, okay? Uh, he's also got to pay for housing and utilities. So again, the IRS is gonna give us here on his collection financial standards, what he's able to use. We go to California, he's in California, okay? And we look at, family of four, and the county that he's in is, oh, I passed it. Where is it? Oh, geez. Right there, Orange County, 3558. So that's what I'm putting here, okay. Um, vehicle loan payment, he doesn't have one, he owns his car. Vehicle operating costs, same thing, we go to our, Oops, let's go back here. Collection financial standards. We're going to look here. Local standards for transportation. Okay, ownership. If he had, if he owned uh, a car and he was making payments, he gets to deduct that. But he doesn't because he doesn't. He's not making any payments. He owns it outright. Okay, but we do get the operating costs. This is for like gas, tires, maintenance, registration, yada yada. They give us for one car, and we look at where we are. In for us, this was in LA, 254 is what we got here. Um, and here's kind of a pro tip that I actually missed with his, his offer and compromise. Gonna look back to our, oh geez. There it is. This is again back from the Internal Revenue Manual. In situations where the taxpayer has a vehicle that is currently over eight years old or has a reported mileage of over 100,000, an additional monthly operating expense of 200 will generally be allowed per vehicle. So they give an example, right? A taxpayer who has a 2009 vehicle with 90,000 miles will be allowed uh, the standard of 231, like we just saw. Well, in his case, it's 254, right? Depends on where you're at in the in the nation. Okay, so we get the 231, at least in this case that they've given us. Geez, where it is? There it is. 231 plus the 200 because it's over 100,000 miles or over eight years old. Okay, his car is over eight years old, so I did miss that. We could have probably got 454 here but I missed it. So nonetheless, pro tip, make sure if you have an old car to add that on to uh, whatever's on this collection financial standards, the local uh, local standards for transportation, okay? Let's see, public transportation costs, since he has a car, we can't use that. If you don't have a car, you can use that. And again, that is on the uh, financial, collection financial standards page, okay? Um, Health insurance premium, he actually does not pay for health insurance, so he didn't get anything there. If you are paying for health insurance, whatever you actually pay for health insurance, you get as a deduction there. Uh, obviously, you got to prove that though. Okay, out of pocket health care costs. This is just another gimme. We're going to look back here. Oh, let's go forward here. Okay, collection financial standards, out of health care, uh, out of pocket health care. We're looking 56. Two two twenty four is what we got here. Okay, uh, current monthly taxes. This was uh, calculated based on um, what he's paying quarterly and just dividing that by three. Okay, to both the Fed and the state is what he's getting here. Secured other debts. Okay, 
actually, that's wrong. This one was actually it goes here. So this this uh, line here is for actually government guaranteed student loan. That's that's actually really popular student loan payments. If you're making those, those go there. Enter the uh, monthly delinquent delinquent state and or local tax payments. That's what we have. So he also owed the state. And before I filed an offer and compromise, generally speaking, I and the taxpayer owes with the state. I'll get the I'll get the taxpayer on a state uh, payment plan first, so then we can use part of that as a deduction here to get our disposable income. So what I did is I got him on I believe it was like five hundred some odd dollars a month, but I, you can't use the full amount. Uh, I believe he owed just over nine thousand dollars to the state. And the IRS, what they allow, again, back to the revenue manual here, I'm going to go, yes, here it is, right? So when the taxpayer owes both delinquent Fed and state taxes, right? So this is the section on how this works. And you'll see here, the taxpayer has an existing agreement. So again, I did get the taxpayer on a, uh, a payment plan, but that's the existing agreement with the state, which was established after the earliest IRS date so he, yes his state taxes were after his iris his iris were first the payment plan amount on the agreement is more than the calculated percentage amount so we're going to kind of brief over that because most people can kind of get around this okay because of this right here advise the taxpayer that he or she can use the amount iris allows for miscellaneous expenses under national uh, standards to pay the additional amount due so what does that mean we go back here to our infamous collection financial standards, and we go down here. The six-year rule for repayment of tax liability, right? The IRS allows, let's see, where does it say this? They basically allow six years for the repayment of your state taxes. So he owed about $9,000. 9,000 divided by six equals, and then monthly divided by 12. So we got that 125 a month is what he got. Now he was actually paying 580, I believe a month with the state, um, but he actually got 127. And that's what we got to put on the uh, 433 here. So now what we do is we add all of these expenses up together. We get the 7,000 total household expenses, remaining monthly income. So then we're doing the total income here, business net income, the 8,000 minus the 7,000 is what we get the 345. And that's, and that's what this is explaining over here. Okay, so that's what we get. The 345 is what's left over after he pays for his uh, necessary living expenses is what the IRS would say this is. Um, then we keep going. Now we uh, calculate the offer. So enter the, the total from box F. There it is. The 345 times it by 12 of uh, 4,140. Ah, okay. So we have two options here. You can either do the, uh, this is what's called the, like the lump sum offer here, this times 12. And this here is like what they call the periodic payment offer. So generally speaking, the lump sum offer is going to be cheaper, right? Times 12, it's the multiple. Whereas the periodic payments times 24. Now, the times 24 is more because you have to pay it off every month after you submit the, the offer. Every month you're making this payment here. The lump sum is generally what I'm doing with, with clients because it's a cheaper, cheaper amount here. Now, you'll find out in another video when we do the 656, that this has to be paid within five months after the offer accepted, which is usually about a year to two years after you file this paperwork. So you have some time to, to come up with this money. Nonetheless, this is what we decided to do. The 345, again, uh, remaining monthly income times 12, the 4,000. <clears> and we're entering that here, box G or uh, H, which is here. So whichever one we decided to do. So we got the 4,000 there and then enter the amount from box A plus B, if, uh, if applicable. So that is, I have to go to the start here. A, right, available uh, individual equity and assets, 900 bucks, plus B, business assets, zero. So that's what we have down here. 
is the 900. So we have the 900 plus the 4,000. Our offer amount was 5,000 bucks. Now there is this section nine here, this other, other information in, in, in his case, you just kind of have to go through this, are you? And, and, and you do have to answer all of these questions. So in his case, none of these applied. So it didn't, it didn't throw his offer into, into question at all. Um, but nonetheless, we did do the offer for the 5,000 bucks. This taxpayer actually owed over $130,000. Uh, so he had a huge savings once we got to the end of this. Again, this one probably took about a year and a half from start to finish to get this done. Uh, but nonetheless, he's already paid the, the offer and uh, he's good to go. But uh, that's how we fill out the, the 433. And, um, oh, this is also very important. Obviously, you got to sign this here. And you got to uh, include the applicable attachments here. So with, in his case, we did the, the bank statements, um, which is here, right? Copy of the individual bank statements, three months worth. And then we did the, the verification of delinquent state taxes. So I had to show uh, a statement that from, the, from the state of how much he owed and the fact that he was on a payment plan. I was the power of attorney, so I attached that. Um, and then you've got to attach the form 656, which I'll go over in another video. Uh, but I also touched that, that P and L and the, which is not here. And so I didn't check those boxes and the, uh, the list of business assets for him. Well, I hope you found this information, this video helpful, uh, in filling out your offer and compromise. If you could do me a huge favor, like, like the video, share it subscribe to our channel uh, for more videos coming up, which will I'll be doing more of these uh, 433 and going through actual examples of clients that I've had offers accepted for. Well, thanks again, guys. Uh, we'll see you soon.